all the young dudes in their budgie jackets and their feather cuts. French flares and stack-heeled boots. It's an era I remember well, if with a few sartorial nightmares thrown in. And it's an era that's captured in a book, a novel called Budgie Wore My Jacket, a humorous and nostalgic rite of passage in 70s suburban London by Martin Silverstone, who's on the line now. Hello, Martin. Hello, Robert. Uh, thanks for having me on your show. Thanks very much for coming on. Can I just say, that is the most perfect song to uh, to introduce the book. Thank you. Um, you know, it's exactly that interim period, you know, when he talks about his brothers at home with his Beatles and his Stones, you know, but I love T-Rex. I mean, that is it. Those are the kids in that book. Absolutely it is. And it's an era I remember well. We, we must be of a similar age, I would have thought. Perhaps I'm a little younger, I don't know. But, um, Let's agree on similar. OK, we'll agree on similar. Um, and it is a period that's often forgotten. I was having just this discussion yeah. with a friend of mine the other day because people sort of seem to think it goes, you know, there, there was hippies and punks kind of, you know, fight, battling it out on the streets. And then suddenly, sorry, hippies and, and skinheads skin battling head. it out on yeah. the streets. Yeah. And I was very much in the skinhead camp as a young kid from a council estate. Uh, and then... Later on, there was kind of punk and disco and jazz yeah. punk. But in the middle, there was this weird period of sort of glam rock and, 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 and big lapels. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the glam rock is that sort of interval period. But what I, what I try to capture in, in the book is how things morphed, you know, from, from one thing to, to the next. Yeah. And it's like a, it's a very interesting transition period. And it is little recorded. I mean, everyone's got the cliches of, of the hippies uh, and the skinheads, you know, peace and love and, and, and bother boys. And everyone's got the cliches of, of punk and funk and disco. Uh, but that gap period, you know, they, they grew into that. And the same people grew out of hippies and skinheads and into, ultimately, you know, punk or, or, or funky nightclubs. And, uh, yeah. That, and it's fascinating. I remember talking to a cab driver once about sort of the clothes and the f style and the fashion of around about 1971, right? yeah. which is slightly earlier than your book, perhaps. But and now it's set in, it starts in autumn 71 when right. things were really, you know, changing. It was two years past the 60s. And those kids in that book were, you know, we missed out on the first summer of love and we're sick and tired of hearing those older hippies telling us how great it was. And, we want something for ourselves. And, and then I, it came along. I was talking to this cab driver and he was talking about the way that skinheads suddenly grew their hair and long and everyone suddenly yeah. had long hair. And he said, in Mile End in 1971, you could hear the hair growing, which is just one of the greatest lines I've ever heard. Absolutely. I mean, and growing into a feather cut, of yes, course. Yes, of course, like, like yeah. Adam Faith in Budgie. Exactly. In fact, I'll tell you, a, a probably, probably a little known fact is that the man who designed the first budgie jacket, which, by the way, wasn't in suede, uh, as mine was and yours was, but was in to a canvas cotton, the man who designed the first budgie, budgie jacket was Anthony Price. Wow, I didn't know that. In, yeah, in his first job at Sterling Cooper, they they saw him at his design school, you know, end of, end of uh, whatever, end of design school fashion show, they nabbed him, and Anthony Price, the guy who dressed Roxy Music, Duran Duran, Spandau Ballet, invented the budgie jacket. How brilliant is that? Yeah. And it was very much a West End thing, although it was sub it, the book is Suburban Kids, and, you know, my family yeah. were out in, in, in Hendon. Um, and... But it was it was based around going to the West End and club, pubs in the King's Road and yeah, and shop, yeah. shops just off of Carnaby Street and Lord John and all of those kind of things, wasn't it? Up west, yeah. going up west. Up west. Yeah. And that's what they do in the book as well, isn't it? Yeah, of course. Yeah, and, and all the things you just mentioned, um, uh, you know, they have a night out in Soho where they're actually sort of, they're actually walking with people who could be from Budgie, you know, all the uh, dodgy characters and what have you through Soho. They're trying to go to a free gig at the Marquee, uh, which, of course, is completely sold out. And the doorman says, you know, you should have known it's a free gig, you know, you've come late. And so they go down the King's Road and there's an interesting scene there when they, because they're from Essex, they're from, from uh, specifically Gans Hill in Essex. And they, it's the furthest west they've been, halfway down the King's Road, you know, for the first time. And, uh, you know, they feel that they're very far from home. 
but other places in Kensington, you know, Kenny Market, yeah. Mr. Freedom, who, you know, created probably the foundation for the whole glam scene, uh, and Bieber for the girls who were all shopping there. It's a time, I mean, yours is a novel and it's a sort of humorous novel. Yeah. There are some of the attitudes of the time would not be very acceptable now, would they, in terms of the sexism and all of that? <laughs> You're, you're right. Um, I mean, I I wrote it to be truthful and, and, and honest. Um, and uh, obviously, this was when we were sort of submitting it for the final, you know, the final before it goes to print and the final edits. In fact, there's a there's an acknowledgement to, to my son who's 20 and doing English lit at uni. And he said, let me have a look through it, Dad. And we ch changed a few things. We took very few things out to make it still authentic but you know will not offend anyone today because as because it, it was a very different time and attitudes were very different and the language and the slang and all of that was yeah was was pretty coarse if you if you think about it uh, it was uh, but hopefully you won't find too much coarseness in, in the novel <laughs> why did you decide to do it as a novel um, because it's a great story, uh, as opposed to an autobiography. Well, or as opposed to a memoir, or as opposed to a book of just, yeah. you know, recounting and recalling that time, if you like. Because it's actually, hey, it, there's, you know, it's fiction, in as much as the characters are composite characters, or exaggerations, or completely made up, but people, the sort of people who would be, would be around. And I wanted to also make, make an actual story, you know, with a story arc, rather than rather than a diary, as it were, or a memoir. So, you know, there's, there's various themes in it. I mean, we've talked about the fashion, I mean, the music as well. I mean, you know, 1971 and 72, obviously, but 71 is considered, you know, the, the, the oh, year. The great years. The, exactly, exactly. And these kids were hearing it for the first time. And uh, so there's a lot of sort of, kind of reviews of the latest album, you know, from Led Zeppelin, or they listen to a Bowie album, or, you know, you, know you, you can, you know, you know how many fantastic albums came out in 71. So it's got that theme as well as, as well as the, you know, music and fashion. Uh, but it's also, you know, it, it's the main protagonist is, is on a story arc, which is, you know, his rite of passage. And it's also a quest. Um, and, you know, there is a resolution at the end. So that's why, it, why it's fiction, because it's a story. It's it's interesting that you mentioned Led Zeppelin then, because there was a sort of again, this is something else I've discussed quite recently. Yeah. There was there was a sort of a brief period of what I would call hard hippies, which was sort of working class council estate kids who got very much into kind of heavy rock. Um yeah. had long hair, kind of donkey jackets, it was kind of building site chic. And and that, that it, again, it's a sort of a forgotten period because I always thought because a bit later on, the boys in my school who were in a heavy rock and that were all the middle class kids with their great coats and their yeah. you know what I mean, but there was a sort of a a, a, a period of and Mot, Mot the Hoople fit very much into that long hair, but quite sort of tough if you know what I mean. I know exactly what you mean. I mean they can't. They're kind of there is a sort of the greasers yeah. uh, subcult uh, is. You know, they meet them in the book, and they're, I mean, they're really into Black Sabbath as, as much as Led Zeppelin. You know, Black Sabbath was probably their, you know, that was it, you know, the beginning of heavy, heavy rock. Uh, yeah, so, so they're, they're in there as well as all the other themes. And, and there's, you know, I've also, I mean, if you think about it, uh, we're talking about the transition. The band that was the, the first sort of hybrid hippie skinhead band was Slade. Yeah. I mean, if you look at uh, in, the, in the beginning, how they, how they dressed, it was, you know, Doc Martens and rainbow striped, you know, hippie stuff and, the, you know, a bit of early glam. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's the faces and Rod and all of that who are very oh, sort yeah. of, you yeah. know, it, 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 the, the budgie haircut is also the Rod Stewart haircut, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, it? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, and how many young lads modelled their hair do on the oh, pictures me. of... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I remember yeah, trying to exactly. get the suit that Rod had on every picture tells the story. Exactly. Made for me yeah. at Shepherd's Bush Market. Believe me, it didn't look as good on me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Every picture tells a story. I mean, that's, that came out in 71, as, as you know. Yeah. You know, so, so, so it was all, it was all new. And, you know, we could, we could sort of turn our backs on the po-faced, you know, we protested and we marched and we did this and that, you know, in 1967 and 68. And all of a sudden, we just wanted to have fun. You know, and and do something different, and so it's a really fun period in time. And I think a lot of today's pop culture, you know, comes from then. You know, the early seventies. 
Yeah, I think it's, it is, as you said, it's a very overlooked era, stylistically and musically and all of that, because it, it doesn't quite fit into the neat sort of view of the 70s either, really. It's not that slightly later, it's not all bouncing kind of blow up things and bright orange colours and all of that. It's, it's a different yeah. world to that. Yeah, it is. It is. But, you know, but it morphed into that. I mean, even the budget jacket eventually, you know, got pointy collars and a couple of pockets on the side. It was the, you know, the 70s dude, dude jacket, you know, the late 70s dude jacket, you know, that evolved as well. There's a touch and it had buttons. Yeah. There's a touch of sort of with, with nail and eye about it as well, isn't there, that period? Um, yeah, but they're not, <laughs> they're not drinking lighter fluid, you know. <laughs> <laughs> nope, they're drinking in pubs on the King's Road, rather self yeah, Well, they're doing that and they're probably having a barley wine if they really want to get, uh, you know, drunk. The book is Budgie Wore My Jacket, a novel by Martin Silverstone. Martin, you clearly My know boy. your stuff. <laughs> thank you thank you very very much you're listening to the Robert Elm Show here on BBC Radio London 